ready to start the broadcast, and I was ready to get some of that into my spirit, but that's okay. That's okay. There'll be plenty of time for that. Welcome to First Baptist Church of Pittsburgh, California. We are happy to see all of your smiling faces under those masks. I'm sure they're there just like they are for me. I'm over here cheesing, and I'm like, they really don't know, but hopefully they can tell from my eyes. And then welcome to our virtual community and family. We thank you for tuning in on this morning. Uh, we pray that you do us a favor on today. Those of you that are in the house, if you could take out your phones and check in on Facebook for us. Let them know you're in worship service on today. Let them know you're at First Baptist Church where praises go up and blessings come down. Let them know you have come out to praise the Lord. Because I'm sure we let them know when we go to the grocery store. We let them know when we go to a friend's house. Amen. That's all right. That, that praise was okay. You don't have to, but make sure you check in. And then for our virtual family, if you are tuning into this broadcast, we ask that you go ahead and like and share. Your like and your share may be just the thing that somebody needs on this week to remind them, I didn't stop and give God any praise. I didn't stop and give God any worship. So let's, let's go ahead and like and share. And then if you feel so inclined, Go ahead and make a comment. Go ahead and do a heart, huh? Go ahead and do a like sign of, of multiple times as the worship service goes forth, huh? To let the no Lord know that you are praising him virtually, huh? Go ahead and tap in and say how you're feeling on today, huh? Go ahead and tap in and say how this worship service is changing your life, huh? Go ahead and tap in and say, even though we're in a pandemic, I feel connected because of the broadcast, amen? Amen. Awesome. Wonderful. Wonderful. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before I do something I'm not supposed to do. Father God, we come to you today just saying thank you. Thank you, Father, for another day, Lord God, because you didn't have to do it. And we're saying, Lord God, in our thank yous, Lord God. And as we stand here together, Lord God, worshiping you in community, Lord God, we ask, Heavenly Father, that you just come stop by here, Lord God, on today. For we don't know what people walked in that door with, Father God. And we don't know what's left back at home, Father God. But we're asking in the name of Jesus today that you shower us with your anointing and your spirit, Father. That all will be well with our soul, Lord God. All will be well with our spirit, man, Father God. That we'll feel the freedom and liberty, Lord God. To lift up our hands, to clap our hands, Lord God. And to stomp our feet up for you on today, Lord God. And to shout out a worship, Lord God, like never before, Father God. Because you're worthy, Heavenly Father. Not just because you woke us up, Lord God. Not just because you kept us last week, Lord God. Not just because you're keeping us right now, Father God. But you're worthy just for who you are, Heavenly Father. You're God Almighty, Father God. You are the one, Lord God. The beginning and the end, Lord God. And we come to give you glory on this day, Heavenly Father. Oh, we worship you. We praise your holy name in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah and hallelujah. I am excited. I am excited. And before I get before myself, let me let you know that we have a presentation coming forth. But before the presentation, we can all join in this part as we sing the congregational hymn. Lift every voice. Let us join in together and sing.
that I am encouraged when that song plays. Yes, indeed. Uh, you all may be seated in the presence of the Lord at this time. Uh, it is now time for our Black History presentation. And before I bring young Noah up, I was scrolling on uh, social media, trying not to tell that I waste time through the week. But anyways, uh, I was scrolling on social media and I ran across a post where a gentleman was saying, <clears throat> the Black History Month, that's the biggest joke. And I don't play into that. Black history every day. You're absolutely right, yes. <laughs> but <laughs> shame on us if we don't take this time to remember. Shame on us if we don't take this time to let the world know that we stand for our culture just as much as they stand for their culture. That we are aware of our past just as much as they want to squash our past. And if that's not enough reason for you or for me, this is the only time of the year I could flip through that closet and say, I haven't worn that all year. Let me put that on. So that's an awesome thing for me as well. If it isn't for you, I am uh, joyous for that reason and to see your faces here today. Um, it gives me a little bit more of a pep in my step in this month, huh? I should have that pep all year. But man, just to connect eyes with another sister, another brother, and to understand that we have a history, huh? That got us this far. We have a history that's rich. Huh? We have a history. And then that ultimate history, if we are like-minded in Christ. Oh, my God. Hey, that's even better. That's even better. Okay. I'm not, you, you don't cut your time out, Brother Noah, just because I was talking. But let us hear from our young person in the form of Brother Noah Chan. And then after he comes, sorry, after he comes, we'll have a Black History presentation um, that will surely knock your socks off. All right, come on, Brother Noah. South Korea to an Asian mom and an African-American father. I moved to Atlanta, Georgia when I was one years old. I attended Forest Park High School where I showcased my football skills as a quarterback. I was a two-time Clayton County Offensive Player of the Year. I attended the University of Georgia, home of the Bulldogs, from 1994 to 1997. I played tailback and to totaled 3,870 all-purpose yards, second to Herschel Walker's record. After college, I dropped by the Pittsburgh Steelers in 1998. I am a two-time Super Bowl champion, and I was the MVP of the Super Bowl 40. In 14 seasons the, with the Pittsburgh Steelers, I became their all-time leading receiver. I also served as a mentor to several younger Steelers, wide receivers. I am now a wide receiver coach for the Florida Atlantic University. Who am I? I am Heinz Ward. can't wait to hear what she has to say. Did I ever tell you that I wanted to be a conductor on the railroad? That Harriet Tubman? Oh, that Harriet Tubman sure was something, wasn't she? Yeah. But no, actually on a drill train. I like when the conductors say, all aboard. Oh, boy. Well, go ahead on and live out your dream. 
and say it. It's Black History Month. They ain't gonna kick us off the train. <laughs> Girl, you so crazy. <laughs> all right, all right. But say it with me. All right. On all right. the on the count of three. Okay. All right. One, two, three. All aboard! law, a colored person couldn't sit across the aisle from a white person. They would have to sit behind the white person to show that they as Negroes were inferior to a white person. American history would have you to believe that the civil rights movement began when Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat and was arrested. The civil rights movement actually began nine months earlier on March 2nd 1955, when a 15-year-old girl and her classmates boarded the bus in Montgomery, Alabama, I was that girl, Claudette Colvin. Hey, y'all gonna have to move back and make room. Yeah, didn't you hear me? Move back. I paid my fare, and it's my constitutional right. Well, all right. Let's see how policemen feel about your constitutional rights. The bus driver pulls over and flags down the traffic cop. Yeah. Why are you sitting here after he asked you to move? Because I paid my fare, and I have the right to sit here. Girl. Why you starting trouble? Just move. Right then, it felt as though Harriet Tubman's hands were on one shoulder pushing me down and Sojourner Truth's hands pushing me down on the other. I could not move because history had me glued to my seat. More policemen boarded the bus and manhandled me to get off. They took me to an adult jail and charged me with disturbing the peace, breaking segregation law, and assaulting a policeman, which has remained on my record for more than 60 years. Can you believe how, can you understand how that must have felt, me being 15 and a kid just trying to ride the bus? the intimidation, the fear that I must have felt for my life. Long before Martin Luther King Jr. became a household name, there was an NAACP, or there was an NAACP, there was an attorney named Fred Gray. Mr. Gray, with the help and advisement of Thurgood Marshall, represented me and three others in the Alabama landmark case, Browder versus Gale. This is a case that successfully ended bus segregation in Alabama in 1956. See, when I was charged in 1955, there were no black judges in the state of Alabama. And only a few months ago, a few years, a couple years ago, in the year 2020, my record was finally cleared by the judge named Calvin Williams, a black man. You may ask why Mrs. Parks was the face of the civil rights movement and not me. Well, I was 15 years old, unmarried and pregnant. In 1955, an unwed teenage mother could not be the face of the movement with hopes of gaining political influence and national attention. 
in order for the movement to gain acceptance and to have political potential to succeed, the right image had to be presented. Mrs. Parks was perfect as a public face for the Montgomery boycott. She was married, she cared for her ailing mother, and her position as a seamstress made her appear respectable in the eyes of the public. You see, there was something far greater than an ego to consider. It was the future of the civil rights for every black American across the country. <laughs> My record was cleared. My record being cleared is important to me because of the message it sends to my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, and their descendants. Because when they go out into the world, the struggle of being black in America is still going on. I want my grandchildren to know that their grandmother kept her seat on the bus, not to be recognized as first, but because I realized at that moment, I was an American who deserved equal treatment under the laws of this country. And I thank God for the courage in 1955 to understand I needed to take a stand for my people. Bless the Lord. Amen. Amen. Come on, we can do better than that. Let's bless the Lord. In, in, in this house. The Lord is great and greatly to be praised. I am honored today uh, to be able to stand and to present uh, one of our friends uh, who is going to be our speaker for today. Uh, a few days ago, uh, about a week and a half ago, I got a word that uh, District Attorney uh, Diane Beckton would be at First Baptist. And of course, my mind starts rolling uh, because how can she come here and not share with us uh, the truth? A a amen. Amen. As we... Uh, as we have designed uh, February to join the movement and to remember our history, uh, one of the things that impressed me is when I thought about her, uh, she is history. Uh, she, she, a, 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 amen. She, she is history. She, she's the first uh, African-American district attorney. She's the first woman uh, district attorney. Uh, she, she, she also hails to be one of the first uh, African-American women to be ordained at the Bethlehem Baptist Church. Uh, so so we, we keep on just blessing her. Uh, so, so we present her today because she's a native of California. She is the product of Oakland Public Schools and a graduate of Golden Gate University School of Law. Uh, again, district attorney, earned a Master of the Theological Studies at Pacific School of Religion. On January 26th, she was among the first women to be ordained in that 75-year history church, Bethlehem Missionary Baptist Church, under the leadership of her husband, Dr. Alvin Bernstein. A amen. Amen. So we bless the Lord uh, for that. So she, she's no stranger uh, to First Baptist Church. She has graced us before, and she is a trailblazer. Uh, she is a supporter. She is our protector, uh, and we are proud of her. Uh, to be able to say that she's our uh, district attorney. Uh, and th then secondly, amen. Then also, not only is she a public servant, but she's also a, a, a called a preacher uh, of, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. A amen. A amen. So she comes with a, a, a multiple of gifts that the Lord has blessed us, and she's using them for his glory. Amen. So with, with, without any further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Reverend uh, Beckham to come 
and to share share with us what the Lord has given us. And we want to welcome our official governments uh, today, and we're glad to see you with us also. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's bless the Lord. First Baptist. You might as well come on and bless the Lord with me. <laughs> Since we all here, it's okay to praise the Lord, you know, because this is the day that the Lord has made, and you might as well go ahead and rejoice and be glad in it. Praise the Lord. Uh, thank you, uh, Pastor Perkins, so much for that warm, warm welcome. I'm always grateful to be here at First Baptist uh, at the invitation of Pastor Perkins and your lovely First Lady and uh, so many of you who are not strangers to me. I am bringing you greetings this morning from the Bethlehem Missionary Baptist Church in Richmond, California, where the Reverend Dr. Alvin C. Bernstein is my pastor. He is our teacher and our leader, and I just happen to be grateful enough to also call him my husband. So. <laughs> And so I uh, want to get right to my task uh, this morning. So if you will bow your heads and join me in a moment of prayer, prayer. Almighty and gracious God, creator of all things, true source of wisdom, origin of all that is, thank you for calling me to your service. Help me to speak your word with faithfulness, passion, and humility. Lord, I humbly stand asking that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart shall be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Speak a word, Lord. If you have your Bibles, if you have your Bibles, turn with me this morning to Exodus 14, Exodus 14, 13 through 15. And I will be reading first from the New Revised Standard Version, Exodus 14, 13 to 15. But Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you and you have only to keep still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward, go forward. The message Bible reads, Moses spoke to the people, don't be afraid, stand firm and watch God do his salvation for you today. Take a good look at the Egyptians because you're never going to see these people again. God will fight the battle for you, and you shut your mouth. I'm going to tag our time together. Please be seated in the presence of the reading of God's word. I'm going to tag our time to today with the hashtag, crying out from a place of wit's end. Crying out from a place of wit's end. Borrowing from our good friend, the Reverend E.L. Branch, I raise a question this morning. Have you ever been at wit's end? You know wit's end, that place where you've done all you can do. You've tried everything that you know. You have no answers. You're worried. You're confused. It feels like you're kind of losing your mind. You have run out of options. You've exhausted all your resources, and now you are at the place of wit's end. It feels like you have nowhere to go and no one to turn to. Or as the song is, says, nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. That's wit's end. You've been in the wilderness in a season of waiting far too long. That's wit's end. It is the story of the man who sat in prison for 15 long years proclaiming innocence. He's at wit's end until finally someone finds that he's innocent and he's exonerated. 
It's our parents and our grandparents enduring the harshness of the Jim Crow South. They were part of the masses of people who simply dropped their tools in the cotton fields, leaving everything behind in search of a just and a fair world. Most likely, there would be no First Baptist Church for over a century if it had not been for the fact that some suffering black people had come to their wits' end. Our people left the South, the oppressive powers they made, uh, that made living feel like a gesture of futility. They were at wit's end. So during those times, First Baptist, you provided a refuge for people at wit's end. Is there anybody here who understands what I am talking about? Anybody who's ever been at wit's end? Well, dropping into our text, and when you get a chance, go ahead and read back to chapter 2. We locate a people in that moment who are called Hebrews. They're controlled by Pharaoh's Egypt. The term Hebrew, according to Walter Brueggemann, describes a vulnerable outsider with no legitimate place in our society. Hebrews who were living under the control of the Pharaoh who has everything including enough feed, food to supply the entire world. Hebrews, like colored people and Negroes and slaves, that was a term used to commodify people and use them as tools for exploitation. I remember as a child, people coming home from a long day's work, dragging in, saying they had been worked like a Hebrew slave. The Pharaoh had everything. He was like the 1% today who have everything but keep wanting more. So you see, the Pharaoh was insecure, so he had nightmares about scarcity. The man who had everything operated like he never had enough. In the text, a famine came over the land. A spirit of scarcity robbed the people of even their imagination. They were at wit's end. Everyday people, the common folk, the farmers, the immigrants, the laborers, the poor, the last hired and the first fired, the people working for minimum wage, they lived at wit's end. First, they spent all of their money on food, buying food from the pharaoh. When their money got short and their change got strange, they begrudgingly sold him their cattle, their livelihood. And then when they had nothing left, they sold him their bodies and became slaves to the Pharaoh. It is the age-old story about the strong controlling the weak and people pushing people to their wits' end. You know, the most valuable commodity that human beings possess is your voice. The capacity to say something about what matters most. Yet the Hebrews lost their voice. They had no political power, no economic power. They couldn't even worship their God. They were completely controlled by the Pharaoh. They were dehumanized and hopeless and voiceless and helpless. But the Pharaoh didn't care so long as the people were silent. But the conditions were too unbearable. The people pushed to wit's end, and all they could do is let out a cry. Perhaps it was a wail, a gasp, a sob. The sound that comes from that deep place, the depth of your soul, when you can't even articulate your pain. You can't get the words out, so you just let out a cry. It's the wits in sound. You're desperate. You're exhausted. Creeping towards numbness, that's wits in. We might have heard the sound coming out of Hagar's mouth when she was de deserted in an economic graveyard in the wilderness. We hear it in blind Bartimaeus' voice when he refused to be silent. Perhaps it is the sound of an enslaved woman whose baby was snatched from her arms and put on the auction block for sale. We hear that cry coming out of the mouth of the woman with the issue of blood for 12 young years before she could reach 
even touch the hem of Jesus' garment. We might hear that sound from the mother, the immigrant mother whose child is snatched from her at the border. You hear the sound coming out of our Jim Crow fathers when they saw their sons hanging from a lynching tree or sent to prison or lying in a corner riddled with uh, bullets. We might have heard the sound from Eric Gardner, I can't breathe. The sounds, the cries that are uttered when we are all at our wits end. And certainly we heard the sound in George Floyd's mouth when he cried out for his long dead mother. That's wits end. We find that in our scripture, it is then when the human pain, when it is voiced, it breaks the silence. And then it stirs up the holy power of God who gets engaged on behalf of those who are living at wit's end. God heard the people's cry. The silence is broken for the Hebrews, but don't miss this. Walter Brueggemann helps us to see that at first the Bible referred to them as Hebrews, but after the cry, after they cried out, they were Israelites. In the silence, they are Hebrews, insignificant ones, Negroes, colored folks, and slaves. After the cry, they become God's people. They become God wrestlers, a people in line for a blessing. They broke the silence. They opened the door for a liberatory course of action. God heard them. He sent Moses and said, let my people go. You see, when the cry breaks the silence, God hears the voice of the helpless, the cries of the vulnerable, and the people who are at wit's end. And God remembers the promises to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob to save God's people. God heard the cries of our own ancestors enslaved in America. God heard the cries of our brothers and sisters who were brutally beaten on the Edmund Pettus Bridge as they marched for voting rights. God heard the cry, Black Lives Matter. God heard the cry of Black Power and hashtag Me Too. God hears the voices of Black blood in America and steps in to find another way. God heard the cries of our people and made a way out of no way. And oh, I wish as I'm standing here today that I'm trying to, because I'm trying my best to make it plain. You see, the people, the Israelites, they're camped by the sea. Their back is against the wall as the Pharaoh is closing in. So the people start trembling. They are in fear. So once again, they're crying out to God because once again, they are at wit's end. Now, interestingly enough, the people who are identified as Israelites, God's covenant people, the God wrestlers, but then they all of a sudden got back to their Hebrew behavior. Their Hebrewism showed up. They no longer felt emboldened with the knowledge that they were God's people, so they huddled, cringing in fear. They are in a state of terror, freedom, still kind of fragile to them, but desperation took over and they forgot that God had already brought them through. So once again, they are at wit's end. Their faith is gone and just like that, they forgot all that God had done for them. Now I'm not trying to put anybody on blast today, but I know that some of us can allow our Hebrewisms to creep up on us. Mm -hmm. So-called good people of God, we all have those moments when we forget who we are and our Hebrewism start to show up. Let some crisis come. Let some challenge knock on your door. And we start acting like anything but a child of God. Hebrewism shows up when we curse instead of pray. Our Hebrewism shows up when we blame instead of bless. Hebrewism shows up when we cringe instead of fight. And our Hebrewism shows up when we give up instead of marching forward. Now, First Baptist, if you are to be a safe place for people who are crying out at wit's end, what shall we do when we hear the cry? Well, the first thing that the Bible tells us is to get out of the way. Get out of God's way and let God be God. Notice in the text, the people fall apart. Moses is calm. The people are frantic. Moses is confident and reserved. 
The people see Pharaoh's chariots and they're in fear of his might. But Moses sees God. Moses draws from the reservoir of testimony and he gains confidence in God. He remembers what God has already done and that God has never lost a battle. So he's confident that God is going to see them through. The church needs to learn how to get out of the way. We are the people of God, but we are not God. We, we believe God, but we don't have the answers that God has. We don't have the insight that God has, nor the resources that God has. So we are more useful when we become like Moses. We stay calm and get out of God's way. Let us allow those to speak who need to speak, but the rest of us need to be silent and get out of the way. In fact, sometimes I'm convinced that God does God's best work when we're asleep. Because, see, when we're asleep, we're out of the way. God can slip a word in our spirit and helps us hear the words of Moses. Don't be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that God will bring. So do not fear when you get to wit's end. Straighten your backs. Stand firm and watch what your God will do. Church, if we are to be a safe place for people at wit's end... <clears throat> Once we get out of the way and just be an echo chamber that echoes loudly the prophetic words, do not be afraid, stand firm and watch what God will do. Secondly, to be a safe place, we must get ready. Moses challenged the people to stand firm, be committed to what you believe God can do. The people had cried for God, but they don't seem to be ready for God. They prayed for another way, but were they ready for another way? They wanted deliverance, but were they ready to be delivered? Were they ready for that deliverance? My late sister used to say, when you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. Too many of us stay in the I'm going to do space. Uh, we are always going to do, but we never truly get ready to do. We say we want a blessing, but are we truly ready for it? Praying people are ready people. Praying works best when we pray for rain and then we put on our raincoats and get our umbrella. And then we know that we are ready to receive God's blessing. So we need to be ready for only what God can do. How many times have we prayed for God to act and then on our own we start trying to fix the problem? God doesn't need your help. Just say your prayers, get out of the way, and let God do what only God can do. And finally, I'm almost done. The Bible says go forward. In other words, get going. When we come to wit's end, that doesn't mean it is the end. Let's get going as we trust God enough to follow God's lead and watch God work. Let's go forward with confidence. Go forward with prayer. Go forward with faith and rely on God's promises. When the people get going, that's when God starts acting. Waters rolled back. The seabed became a highway. One side was an opening to the other side. A way became made out of no way. And there was no turning back because what God promises is only lying ahead. As Paul once said, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining to what lies ahead. So I say press forward for the prize of the upward call of Jesus. Let's get going, reaching those things that are ahead. Let's get going, and God will protect us, God, and the Lord will fight for us. Go forward like Rosa Parks saying, I knew somebody had to take a stand. Go forward like Muhammad Ali who said, you have to take a risk to accomplish anything in life. Go forward like Maya Angelou. If you don't like something, then you need to try to change it. Go forward and be like Shirley Chisholm, unbought and unbossed. Go forward like Frederick Douglass, who says power concedes nothing without a demand. And then go forward like Barack Obama, who said the future rewards those who are willing to press on. And I don't know about you, but I'm going to press on. 
So go forward with the remembrance that we are beloved people of God and that we are worthy. Don't live in a place of wit's end. You can break the silence and cry out. I want to hear you cry out. Cry out for justice. Cry out for freedom. Cry out for my living is not going to be in vain. Cry out for equality. Cry out for the poor. Cry out for the sick, for the shut-in. Cry out for the prisoners cry out for a healing in our city cry out for wholeness cry out for a hope cry out until the rivers roll down and the mighty waters come down like righteousness like an ever flowing stream cry out until freedom rings cry out until we can say free at last cry out for amazing grace and if you got nothing else to cry say glory say glory say glory praise God God for glory. And then after you cry out, be still. Shut your mouth and see what God will do. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Reverend Beckton. God bless you. She told us this morning that the Lord will fight for us. All we have to do is be still. Be still and know that I am God. You know, that's my, my prayer every morning. I start off with be still and know that I am God. Then I said, be still and know that I am. Then I said, be still and know. Then I said, be still. Then I just say, be. God wants us to be who we are and let him be who he is. Be still and know that I am God. Lord, we thank you today. We th Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, for the Ha <laughs> the message this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, because you allowed us to hear that which was necessary for us and our growth. We love you and we lift you up. Now, Lord, we come to you. There may be someone here that has not given their life over to you. We pray now that you'll touch hearts, that you will bless those that are sitting right now wondering what really was this message about and why is it affecting me in this way. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you and we lift you up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a mighty God we serve. If there is one today who doesn't know Jesus as their Savior and Lord, is there, if there is one today who is questioning why are these folks so, so, so excited about the name of Jesus, you can come right now. You can come right now. You can stand up. You can raise your hand. Hallelujah. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, taste and see that the hallelujah, that the Lord is good. 
Hallelujah. Thank you for this young man this morning. If there's another, don't don't wait until you feel like you're ready. I don't believe. I've been told that you should come just the way you are. You can't clean yourself up, but God has all power. He can do the cleaning up. Is there one? Is there one that maybe has strayed away? You know you're not walking in the way that God would have you to walk. This is your time. Hallelujah. You can come right now. Is there one today? Hallelujah. You know, I, I, I work with young people every day. So when I see a young man that has decided to change his life, give his life over to Christ, I know the Lord is still in the working business. He's still in the healing business. He's still in the blessing business. Thank you, Lord. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this young man. We pray, Lord, that you'll just touch his heart, his life, and his family, Lord. That he will get the support from them, Lord, that he needs to walk in the way that you would have. Hallelujah in the way that you would have him to walk. Thank you, Lord, for each one that's gathered here today. Lord, there may be another who didn't come forward, but you know, Lord, that their heart is there. So we ask, Lord, that you'll just touch and bless them, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And if you may be and you didn't, really want to raise your hand, you didn't want to come forward, we have ministers, we have people here that you can come and talk to. Just come up front at the end of service, and there will be someone here that can share with you the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is that all right? Let's say praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Have a Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. We have Jelani coming, and he wants to be connected with the body of Christ. So let's say amen as we pray amen. for him and lead him. Praise the Lord. It is now time for our worship of through our giving. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8 said, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. God loves a cheerful giver. God has blessed us so that we can bless someone else. So we pray that this morning as you prepare to give, that you will just ask the Lord, Lord, what would you have me to do this morning? Let us pray. Lord, we thank you again for your continued blessing. We thank you, Lord, that you've just been so good. You brought us from a mighty long way, from all the issues that our forefathers went through, Lord, that we might be able to stand here today and say, thank you, Jesus, for all that you have done. We pray, Lord, as we prepare now, Lord, that you touch our hearts and our minds. Bless us as only you can, Lord, that we might be able to bless someone else. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Amen. If you would stand now and follow the directions of our ushers, we would appreciate it.
Amen. Praise the Lord. Come on, praise the Lord, somebody. Hey, thank, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord for that message on today. Amen. Uh, they challenge us with truth. Stand still and see the deliverance of the Lord. A couple things. We want to say thank you to First Baptist uh, for just your support uh, throughout the month of January. Uh, we had uh, in excess of 13 funerals just in January. Uh, so we rallied together and supported uh, in stages and groups. And I'm just a proud pastor to say that I'm pastor of First Baptist Church who gave that kind of support. So to God be praised. Uh, in that, as we go through this uh, pandemic, uh, COVID-19, I want you to be uh, cautious but proceed. Not to be so fearful that you can't do anything, but to be cautious as you proceed and trust God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And being careful, we have secured uh, the, uh, tests for each person here today. So we have a kit uh, here in the best of you, one per person. A amen. And then we have to resupply, we'll resupply as we go, but we have tests for each person uh, be be uh, mannerly, amen, amen, be, be, be mannerly as you uh, leave, uh, that one person can get it, and then we could recycle it as, as we go. Uh, but we're trusting God. We're standing still, but we're proceeding with caution. A a amen, amen. We're not going to stop doing ministry uh, because of fear, but we're going to proceed as we trust God. So to God be praised. Again, we're always grateful to see Dr. Bernstein. Uh, just, just raise your hand so they can uh, see all the things that, that we are able to hear. Uh, several of our members are students of his, so we bless God. Our last words will be by our speaker, uh, Reverend Beck, to come give us our benediction on today. You guys are one, so you decide. Hey, amen. <laughs> To him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. May God bless you and keep you. Amen. Thank you for attending First Baptist Church online worship service. We pray that you were blessed by the preached word. If you have been led to support this ministry, there are multiple ways to do so. By phone, text the dollar amount and fund name to 925-232-4426. You can also visit our website, www.fbpittsburgh.org and click the Give Online button to submit your secure donation. Or you can give using our mobile app. You can download the app by visiting the Apple or Google Play Store. Search FBC Pittsburgh. And once you have downloaded the app, click on the Give Online option to process your secure donation. We thank you in advance and may God bless you richly.